Thank you everyone for coming to yet another wonderful Sunday speaker in town hall series with the Humanist Association of San Diego. Today is the day before Memorial Day and on Memorial Day, we remember those who have served in uniform. One of our past presidents and, and community leaders from San Diego who, who died in 2006 was Phil Paulson. Phil Paulson wrote a stirring essay for the Humanist magazine in 1989 called, I Was an Atheist in a Foxhole. There's this popular misconception that there are no atheists in foxholes. And today we are going to commemorate those of us in our community, those humanists and atheists who have served this country and other countries. We are going to have a candid and wonderful discussion on humanism and militarism. And we're going to discuss the role of the peacemakers and hopefully see that this world is getting better in terms of being less violent and more cooperative. So in his essay, I was an atheist in a foxhole, Phil wrote, the radio man sputtered, oh Lord, Lord help us. My response to him was to stop praying. I exclaimed to hell with God, you help us. You radio back from mortar and artillery fire support. Fortunately, he regained his composure and radioed the forward observers for fire support to be directed at our map coordinates. Common sense dictated that staying alive was more important than wasting precious time praying. Consequently, he, he helped save our lives. The next morning, I was thrilled to see the men from my company. Fortunately, I didn't sustain any personal injuries from the night assault. However, the assaults of the next morning struck me personally when a surviving soldier said to me, see Paulson, God answers prayers. I replied, I'm damn glad that somebody was an atheist in a foxhole. He laughed because he thought I was joking and I had to allow him to believe that I was. I had to keep my atheism to myself. Today is a solemn day. It's an important day. Today we ponder war and our theme of the day, which is peace. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, a day arising from our own civil war in which we commemorate those who have died in uniform. We also consider our longest running conflict, the war in Afghanistan that has cost more than 45,000 lives, 2,300 of those American. When we hear of casualties, oftentimes we consider the lives of our service personnel first, but all human lives matter. And probably more so the slaughtered civilians who have unwittingly found themselves in harm's way. As humanists, we look not only to the human toll, but also what we can do to prevent this from happening in the future. Undoubtedly, there were casualties who were humanists and atheists in worldview. One of those deaths in Afghanistan was an American who was cut down by friendly fire, Pat Tillman. Tillman gave up a life of comfort, a cushy NFL contract and a career as a professional football player to take up the cause of fighting for the United States and its ironically named War on Terror. This prompts a discussion on the, of the assertion that there are no atheists in foxholes. We know that there are, and several of us here today are atheists and humanists who have been in foxholes, and they're going to share their stories with us. The topic of humanists in foxholes also begs for a discussion on the philosophical consistency of being humanist and enlisting for what May be like what may likely throw you into direct conflict with your ethical precepts. We'll talk about this. And then, if you are a humanist, once you're in the armed forces, what might you experience? And what might your experiences be like? We have a special guest from an organization dedicated to the advocacy of non theists in the US military. We will hear from the president of the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers on these issues. Then we'll discuss the role of religion and religious narrative in US military drives for recruitment, 
onboarding and in operations. Following this, as this is San Diego, and seven of the US military's bases are located in our community, we will hear from our community's veterans, their stories, and this will be facilitated by our very own Craig Shattuck. As we consider peace, we must explore the humanist perspective on peace and the humanist perspective on conflict. We'll do this today. Finally, we'll take a few minutes to contemplate not only those who make war, but also those who make peace. As Major General Smedley Butler once titled his pamphlet, War is a Racket, we have to consider if this is a racket that humanists belong in. This may get heated, but we're strong enough as a community to ruffle each other's feathers because we trust each other not to yank them out. And ruffling is okay. It makes us stronger. And not only are we commemorating those who died in the service of the US military, there's another group of victims who we must consider today. We must spend a moment to consider and acknowledge the victims of one of the most dastardly episodes in American history. 100 years ago tomorrow, more than 300 men, women, and children were brutally slaughtered in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in a true crime against humanity perpetrated against Tulsa, Tulsa Oklahoma's Black residents by a mob of 2,000 of its white residents. The assailants burned buildings, used World War I planes to bomb from the air, and the remaining 6,000 residents of, quote, Black Wall Street were placed in internment camps. This was not merely an act of an organized mob of civilians, but law enforcement participated in this as well. While not officially listed as such until 1948 as being an actual crime, retroactively, we could argue that this was certainly a crime against humanity within our own country. We must commemorate those who, who we've lost. We must learn from each other. And we must seek peace because including pacifism and a better future, our core ethical impulse for humanist and humanism is cooperation and mutual flourishing. So today we concentrate on peace because we are humanists and we are here to help. Jason Torby is the president of the Military Association of Patriots and Thinkers. After a decade, we welcome him back to the Humanist Association of San Diego. The Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers is a national nonprofit building community for atheists and humanists in the military. Jason has held seats on the boards of the Secular Coalition for America and its Educational Fund, the American Humanist Association and its lobbying affiliates, and the Humanist Society. He also served as the original endorsing agent for the Humanist Society's clergy chaplain and lay leader programs, and has performed as a celebrant for humanist weddings and funerals, including a military burial at Arlington National Cemetery. After joining the military in 1994, Jason has been active with the non-theist and human with non-theist and humanist communities. He has addressed issues of separation in church and state and the equal opportunity for humanistic for non-theistic service members in the army's basic training programs, army parachutist training, military academy programs and in combat situations. Jason's education includes a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering Management from West Point and a Master's degree in Business Administration from The Ohio State University. He's a humanist celebrant recognized by the Humanist Society. After graduating with honors from two intelligence training programs, Mr. Torby has offered direct, was offered direct admission to the United States Military Academy, 
Upon graduation, Jason was commissioned as an officer and served for five years in Germany, Kuwait, and Iraq with the Army's 1st Armored Division. He left the service in 2005 with the rank of captain to pursue an MBA. Jason speaks on a range of issues related to the atheist, humanist, and general non-theist community, especially as these issues relate to the military. Everyone, please join me in giving a warm San Diego welcome to our guest of the day, Jason Torby. Hello. Hey, thanks for uh, the intro, Jason. Thanks for having me. And thanks to the humanist community uh, there in San Diego for having one, right? You know, the Humanist Association of San Diego is a longstanding organization. And, and as Jason said, in, in a community with so much, so much military, uh, it's nice to have a humanist presence there. And, and I appreciate all of you uh, having, a, having a thriving community. So thank you for that. I'm going to take a minute to pop up some slides here, and we're going to go through those, and then I'll answer some questions after and be available for the rest of the program. I think it's going to be a, be a great time. So, All right, everybody see that? Now, I just put that on uh, the full screen. Does, does it look like the full screen there now? Yes, it looks okay. good. Okay, all right. Well, so this is a picture I, I normally use when I speak around the country, and uh, it happens to be from San Diego. It was one of our best events there many years ago in 2014, not quite 10 years, um, on the USS Midway. Uh, it was a wonderful Memorial Day service, and uh, I hope that you know, you'll be able to recreate that at some point there. It's a really excellent event. It's an excellent space, and um, Al Bell, I don't know if he's still available and uh, active in the community. He's right there. Uh, in the center of the crowd, and uh, we were able to honor him as uh, an atheist in a foxhole who, you know, really did the right thing when it was a hard thing to do the right thing. So um, that's some that's a story I, I hope you'll tell as well, and I'll talk a little bit about more about him later. So this is me a little bit more. Uh, I just like these pictures. I just threw them in here because I felt like uh, putting up this collage. This is me at the great religious uh, communities of the world. <laughs> So you got you got your Stonehenge. The bottom right there is Gethsemane. You know the Garden of Gethsemane in uh, Jerusalem, uh, and then uh, in the upper right there, that's Cosmic Jesus, as they say. Um, and uh, that's it at the Mor the Mormons are there on the top, and then the um, in the news has been that Golden Dome there on the West Wall, there in Jerusalem on the right, and then the bottom left. This is me shaking a fist. They had you know at this government you know, building, right? This this giant government building right out front that he had, had this huge nativity scene. It's like it's like they never heard of separation of church and state at the Vatican. You know, so I just had to shake a fist at him and show him how mad I was. So uh but yeah, so that's a little bit of a little bit of my background. Um but the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers, that's the site there, militaryatheist.org. You know, we're trying to support um, atheists and foxholes, wherever they may be. You know, we're focused primarily on the United States, but there are over 20 countries represented among our membership. Uh, and there's been a lot of problems the last, you know, several years, right? You know, there's COVID, you know, there's political divisiveness, you know, a lot of issues. And um, we haven't been doing as much because I got to tell you, the, uh, the fundamentalists, the religious right, the really, you know, in my opinion, the the national, the United States backbone of religious fundamentalism and especially political Christianity is the chaplain corps in the United States military. And and you know, as much as we fight, the the reality is, so service members really have to put their career on the line to take up this cause, and they shouldn't have to do that. So we we try to support them uh, directly with care packages, with local events, with connection to others who support them, um, and you know, kind of advice as they move through their career and, and what essentially is a hostile environment. Um, not just the stress of being away from home, the stress of doing military work, which is very difficult itself, but, and combat, obviously, you know, losing people in combat, which is what Memorial Day is about, um, remembering that stress, but they have to do that all in the context where the support structures, the, the individual counseling, the memorial services, they all revolve around this idea that everybody 
is and should be a fundamentalist Christian. And, and it's really very difficult. So that's really good that you've got a supportive community there. And I'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, on a day like Memorial Day, you can have an event like this. Um, and on other days, reach out to those military communities and say, hey, you know, there's support for you that's not just fundamentalist Christianity. There's support for you uh, in our community. And you can come out, be part of a community, uh, connect with others of like mind, because in the military, like it or not, um, we're still a minority, even if they weren't hostile. Um, atheists are a minority in the United States. Atheists are uh, atheists and foxholes are certainly a minority within the military, a greater minority. So it's it's important for the civilian communities to reach out and provide that assistance. And MAF can provide assistance directly to them, but to the extent that you know our organization can provide materials and connection to you as a local uh, community to connect with those military communities, that's super critical because you know we simply can't do local community. National organizations just always fail at it. Um, and so that's why your local communities, to the extent that you're successful, can leverage your local, your local community to support um, those atheists and foxholes. So um, I appreciate you doing this event and, and what you've done in the, in the past. Uh, this is Memorial Day, and while we should remember things like the Tul Tulsa uh, massacre, um, that's a terrible, you know, disaster in our in our nation's history. One of many, one of too many that we should never forget, um, and certainly fight against to stop that, you know, creeping, you know, ever creeping tide of um, racial violence and and subjugation we have in the United States. Um, Memorial Day is about. United States military and, and remembering our fallen. Um, so, so that's what this slide is about. Just remember just more recent numbers about we do have people all around the world. I mean, we talk about Afghanistan and that's important to talk about because it is our country's longest conflict. But you, United States military is, is scattered around the globe, throughout the Middle East, you know, in Northern Africa um, and other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, as well as Afghanistan and, you know, not to mention Europe, Japan, you know, places you would normally, you know, expect, uh, you know, that they're more talked about. But military personnel are in harm's way around the world. And those casualties have declined significantly over time, but that's to the extent that we have pulled back. And, and the search for peace, which is very important, has continued. And to the extent we have more and more political pressure for peace and more and more political pressure against you know, fascist tendencies of honoring not just military personnel and their sacrifice, but honoring just on principle all military activity, regardless who it hurts, we need to get away from that and you know, support our troops and the important things that they need to do and make sure every time that our lives are on the line, it's, it's done to help people and done for humanitarian purposes never to just expand a national agenda. So, you know, these are statistical numbers um, and we should take a minute to remember, you know, people are dying, military personnel are, are dying and it should be for a good cause. And if it's not more and more pressure to make sure to listen to all the military personnel and their calls for peace. But statistics are statistics. And I wanted to put up at least, you know, these two faces. These are people who died, PFC Miguel Villalon, uh, and Staff Sergeant Ian McLaughlin and, you know, their families, you know, don't have them anymore. And they went out and they fought uh, and they died uh, on their first combat tours in Afghanistan. And this was last year. Um, I didn't pick them for any particular person because they didn't, for any particular reason, because they aren't, they, they died. Um, and just like so many other thousands and thousands of military personnel have. And, you know, we should take time to remember them and, and use their, you use this inspiration to think, you know, what are our troops for, uh, out in the world for? What are they doing? And what kind of pressure can we put on to make sure they're doing the right thing? You know, if nothing else, they can die. You know, they, they've died to defend the nation or at least to make sure that we do the right things when we're out there fighting. Um, so I wanna take a moment with their, with their picture showing um, just a few moments to, you know, have a little memorial on this Memorial Day.
Uh, it's a, just a short moment, right? Moment of silence, as they say, right? And, and you know, in this community, we can all agree, I think, that no amount of prayer uh, is going to make, you know, ennoble our lives and sacrifice. But some contemplation, some remembrance, you know, a moment of silence where we really consider what, what right looks like, what national actions are the right things to do. I think that you know, that is a way to ennoble their sacrifice to say, how, how could it have been better? You know, how can it be better in the future? How can it be better for all those young men and women who are out there serving now? And they weren't necessarily atheists and foxholes. Uh, I don't know. Again, it's, you know, all the sacrifice matters, you know, regardless what their religious beliefs are. But uh, I do want to take a minute to talk about the population for the statistics for atheists and foxholes. MAF does these through Freedom of Information Act. And you can see over time, you know, this is information that we pull from the Department of Defense. Over time, just this uh, astronomical increase, it's still a very small portion of the population who's willing to self-identify on their official records as atheists. But those numbers increase and increase over time. Um, and you can see that other populations are, are very out of whack. You know, the chaplains, have evangelistic Christians, you know, that kind of political, uh, you know, you better convert to Christianity, we only care about Christians, those kind of people uh, are, are among the chaplain corps, and those are a very small portion of the population among the general population. You know, and that uncertain number, 30%, they don't even know who necessary, you know, what their beliefs are. So 30% of the military is unknown, which means they don't care enough to actually identify as what they are. Um, and yet we have this huge chaplain corps overpopulated with evangelistic Christians that puts this negative pressure. And that's why what you do is you know, so important. But all those atheists and foxholes are out there and these are pictures you know, just out there, people serving in different conflicts over, uh, over the years. You know, every conflict, there are atheists and foxholes, there always have been in every conflict the military, the United States has been in and there are today as well. So it's very important to take a minute to remember them. And these are, are all atheists and foxholes. These are a few too, a couple from here. You know, Doug right there is there. Uh, this is at a Marine Museum, right? And they were saying there's no atheists and foxholes. So we stood around there and took a picture to show them there are, right? And that's what it's about. And that's what you can show your community as well, that there are atheists and foxholes. Because you know there are veterans in your area. Phil Haycock, he's actually from the east, um, but it's important your veterans communities as well. Keep in mind uh, at these VA hospitals, uh, hospice programs. Um, there's outreach that you can do to say, hey, you know, where are the atheists and foxholes in your community? What support do you have at this VA hospital? And you'll find lots and lots of Christians and chaplains assigned there. You know, that are handing out Bibles and doing whatever they do, but very but very rarely do they reach out to you and if they're not calling humanist association of san diego probably means they're not calling anyone so put pressure on them to connect you with those veterans you don't have to be a chaplain you don't have to be endorsed you don't have to have any special community you go to those chaplains and their job is to reach out to you and then you're not talking to random people you're talking to humanists only who asked you're saying hey there are atheists and foxholes there are humanists there are other people among your veteran communities put us in contact, we can help. We're not gonna to talk to anybody else, just to them, we can help. Because I'll tell you what, uh, the United States has a lot of tendencies. We've got these giant stadiums wrapped around US flags, you know, full size. And you know what else? They think Christianity is, you know, being American is about being Christian. And that's something we have to work against. And that's something you can work against to the extent your local community, you know, pushes this idea that there are atheists and foxholes, we are serving. And we do have, you know, an inspired and ethical idea of what service looks like. Um, you can undermine that, that kind of false association with Christianity and being American. And that's something that can improve, you know, the, the visibility and the, and the perception of your community by associating your community with the service that your people have uh, provided to the nation. Because again, that's, that's what we call the American atheist dilemma. They love the military, we serve in the military, but they hate us and it shouldn't be that way. So uh, doing your local homework in your community, again, this seven um, 
seven bases in the San Diego area. That's good information. There's also uh, VA hospitals and VA clinics throughout the, that region. Uh, there's also um, ROTC, National Guard installations, and enlistment centers. One thing to keep in mind, those you know, young kids away from home the first time, you know, have a lot of pressure to conform. You know, connecting with them at the enlistment centers allows them to bring their values and bring their community with them to basic training. Um, we can provide support and connect them when they're in basic training. So, so consider reaching out to the enlistment center there in uh, San Diego as well. But what this community, th this is something I post to a lot of uh, local groups that I'm talking to, and you're already way ahead of the, the game. This is what we're really doing today. And this is my primary suggestion is to find the stories, uh, those military stories and tell them to your local community. We're telling them to each other today and tell them to your local community. I think that's really important. And again, right there in the middle is Al Bell. Uh, Jason already met, mentioned uh, Pat Tillman and then Hans Kostin is there on the left. You know, he served in World War II, was in charge, elected as leader of an internment camp and suffered a lot of, uh, you know, personal attacks and, and beatings because he protected the Jews among the population. It's a really inspiring story and there's a, a documentary called Berga about it. Uh, and a last quick note, um, we partnered with uh, Secular Student Alliance to provide some military scholarships this year to the extent you know anybody who might be eligible for that. So uh, keep that in mind uh, from Secular Student Alliance. And those are my prepared remarks. We've got the website there, you know, some documents that we might be able to provide along. And again, a last uh, special thank you to the Humanist Association of San Diego for having this event today. And uh, this hat, American Atheist, I got this as a gift. Somebody just made this hat and gave it to me at a, at a San Diego event one year. And I still have it. It's super cool, I think. You know, very high quality. So I thought I'd wear that today during the event. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I hope that's enough talking from me. I'm happy to answer questions if you'd like, and I look forward to the rest of the program. I think that this is a good time so, to, to have a conversation on on religion in, in the military itself before we go into, hold on one second, the spotlight myself. All right. Um, before we go into, into a further discussion about um, personal stories, I think it'll be a good lead into um, personal stories. So thinking about this, um, I have never, I, I've, I've never served in the military. And I, I think that this will be a great way to have, start up the conversation to warm up people to speak. Um, leading in with your answers, Jason, but then anyone else on here who has served in the military, um, what your thoughts are. And in, in the process of recruiting, in the process of, of recruiting and onboarding, such as um, the swearing-in ceremony, et cetera, et cetera, and including things like the oath, um, how much how much religious symbolism and and narrative is employed in recruiting and 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 swearing in and the onboarding process to bringing people into the military and getting them into the military i think it totally depends um now obviously the oath has an optional an entirely optional religious portion you know, the so help me God portion. Again, it's entirely optional. It's written right in the first uh, first clause of the United States Code that you know oaths can always be affirm affirmed instead. Now, beyond that, I think there's a wide variety. Uh, so when you prior to joining the military, there's normally an association between the recruit and the recruiting station, and I think that recruiting station, you know, has a wide wide array of opportunity for um, you know, church activities or religious activities. But I would say, you know, for the most part, the, the religious activities during recruiting, it, you know, kids are trying to graduate high school and go into the military and, and basic training is such that like whatever happened during your recruit, your, your uh, recruitment phase, you probably basically forgot all of it anyway. Um, I would say there's a, you know, other than like that guy lied to me, <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't remember much from your recruiting recruiting period. 
I actually went through Marine uh, recruiting uh, myself and they just want you to do push-ups and stuff. It's just very, very uh, uh, physical, physically focused. Um, so used to say, uh, in my experience, I didn't have a lot and I don't, I don't get a lot of complaints, complaints from the recruiting period myself. It's more once you get in and you have a job and you know, you have a job to lose and you have like awards and promotions and things like that, that they really hinge on you towing the line for, um, or at least tolerating their, their religion that's everywhere within day-to-day -day life in the military. That's, that's really the main concern. And, um, uh... We have, we have people who are on the chat who served in the 1970s, uh, like, like Mike Lewis. And when we were discussing putting this event together, uh, not just during recruitment, but in active military service, how much religious symbolism and, and narrative and statements are there? And I want to turn this over to Mike Lewis, because you mentioned while you were in the Marines, it was God, country, core, kill, kill, kill. And you wanted to to bring that that aspect up of the employment of religion through the use of, of God as a as an instigator for killing other people. Yeah, Jason. Uh, when I went into the Marine Corps uh, towards the end of 1968, we were right in the middle of the Vietnam conflict, and uh, when I got to boot camp, the proselytizing was just incredible right from the get-go uh, they made us recite that phrase god country core kill 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 many times every day uh, in the marine corps boot camp in san diego nobody gets to just walk around you know you're all together as your little company unit with your drill instructor leading you around uh, but nobody gets to walk free even if you have to get up in the middle of the night to, to go to the bathroom that the barracks do not have bathrooms uh, they'll let you out by yourself but you have to run you cannot stop you can't talk to anybody and there's guards and if they see you walking you're in trouble so you're really you know there there's no uh, discussions or anything among the troopies. Uh, the only time you're together is in formation, whether you're going to uh, training or going to the mess hall or whatever. <clears throat> and that's when the drill instructors would make you recite this God country core, kill, kill, kill. And uh, if they saw your lips weren't moving, they'd have you on the ground doing push ups. You, you couldn't bow out of. You couldn't just not say it. So I, I learned to say dog country core, kill, kill, kill. And unless the drill instructor was alongside of me, he wouldn't n notice that it would, you know, the other people would kind of drown it out. So I never said God unless the drill instructor was right next to me, then you'd have to, or you'd be punished for it. But I also had to go to church and uh, they gave me the choice I'm a recovering ex-Catholic, and I got my faith when I was about eight during catechism. By by about ten, I'd lost it. Uh, so they said, "Well, you can't skip church in boot camp in the Marine Corps. You either go to Catholic church or you go to Protestant church." So, you know, I think a Catholic confession is just uh, child abuse, brainwashing. You know, to make a child try to invent sins they committed when they're eight years old before they learn about the sins of the flesh, you know. But uh, anyway, I could not opt out of uh, going to church. And I'd really be interested if somebody has recently been through boot camp, if there's any proselytizing going on. But my experience in the Marine Corps was very short. Uh, I had an opportunity to enlist for two years, and I chose the Marine Corps because you could be an officer without a four-year degree. And uh, I thought, well, there's a chance I could like it. I was raised, born and raised in Oceanside, military town, and had Marine friends and stuff. And uh, 
was naive when I went in, to say the least. But when I went to Vietnam, I worked entirely with Korean Marines. The, the ROCs uh, are allies, you know, from the Korean War, South Koreans. <clears throat> and none of them spoke English except for the officers. And uh, I was out in the field the whole time in Vietnam, just south of Da Nang. And the Koreans did not have any churches in the field. They didn't have any ministers or anything. Uh, and I was a radio operator and myself. And if if my if I had a radio operator partner, that would be the only other English speaking person or Caucasian that I would ever see would be my partner. And he wasn't always there either on, you know, uh, change of rotation or going to rest and relaxation or whatever. <clears throat> so even though I was witness to every death, I, you know, I would have to call in the medevac helicopters. Uh, there were no chaplains looking at, I, I had to evaluate this, the severity of the injuries for to prioritize the American medevac helicopter mission so we wouldn't want somebody with his toes blown off to take a mission away from somebody with a you know missing leg or something so i i determined the priority of every medevac mission never saw any clergy in fact even the medics were reluctant to go look at the body sometimes cuz most of our victims were booby traps now called eids uh, or ieds but uh they were explosive booby traps back then, but uh, so I, I never operated very seldom with American Marines, so I wasn't in contact with them to have one alongside of me in the in the foxhole, but I certainly dug more than one foxhole and was in it to uh, escape small arms fire and mortar fire. But fortunately, uh, none of my Korean compadres uh, could share their religious beliefs, but I didn't notice any at all. But anyway, I would love to hear from anybody who's recently been through the boot camp and see if they've uh, changed their unholy ways. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for those of us who haven't been in military service, uh, is it appreciated or is it trite to say thank you for your service? Not so much on Memorial Day, I would say I'm still alive. <laughs> Today is preserved for those who have fallen. Uh, so, so Steve, Steve, you, you were a Marine. You were a Marine. How much, how much religious symbolism and narrative and, and active religiosity, um, like Mike had said, you either go to church or, or, or that, that was your, your thing, or you didn't get free time or something like that. I know Mike has talked about that before. What has been your experience being in the military, Steve Hill, um, and, and encountering religion? All right. For one, you don't ever say you were a Marine, because once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. My apologies. You got that, fella? <laughs> yes. Hey, listen, man. I went in, I went in boot camp January 1979. I had one of the worst experiences of my life because about three days before boot camp ended, my father passed away. And me, me being a, a new, you know, <laughs> a not living at home atheist, guess who I had to go and see? I had to go see this church guy, which, you know, the only good thing about it, at least he was, he, he was a black man. But anyway, he's the one that told me, oh, your father's passed away. You got to pack up all your shit and get home now. So, yeah, yeah, it, it was a lot of military shit pushed on us, like straight out, you know, straight in the boot camp. Even even all of the old uh, movies they used to show us, you know, they, these motivational history of the Marine Corps, you know, for God and country, you know. I, I see where these fucking QAnon people get it at. You know, it's it's been here. It's it's with us all the time. But um, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if it, it's 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 probably changed by now. I mean, when I went to boot camp, you could still get hit and kicked, and there was nobody to tell 
about it by a drill instructor. Uh, and I think the, the last Marine I talked to who went in in the 90s said uh, they can't even curse at them anymore. So, you know, like everything else, it's evolving and changing and doing this and doing that. But, you know, it, it sure does kind of uh, dishearten you when you, you know, when you're a young man, 17, graduated high school early so you could go to boot camp in January. Um, all of this shit, all of this, these things that they tell you America is. And, you know, within the last 10 years or so, I have learned and discovered and through my life experiences that everything is pretty much bullshit. Every, everything you've known. I mean, this is, this is where you hit cognitive dissonance at, where you're like, damn, all of this stuff I, I brought was brought up with listening to, you know, <laughs> watching the Western movies and all, all, all of this is bullshit. So this is why right now, before I go, because I have a conference to do in, in eight minutes in Sacramento, um, I'm running for Congress. I don't know if you told anybody, Jason. Not yet. Okay, well, fuck it. I'll tell them. I'm running for Congress. I'm pretty sure I'm, I'll be the first uh, openly satanic humanist to ever run for con Congress. But I've got to do this as a way to tell everybody why we can never fix law enforcement. For, for those of you who don't know, I'm a retired peace officer. Um, we can't fix law enforcement because our politicians won't allow us to fix law enforcement because they use law enforcement to get elected, which leaves them kind of like in a state of stupidity where they can't complain one bit about what law enforcement, the, perp the perpetration of fucking violating of your civil rights, they can't say shit because they know they're gonna need the police unions and the support of law enforcement and all of that imagery and ideology that you see bestowed except you know on January 6th when they were fucking beating them with fucking blue lives matter flags anyways I gotta go man because I gotta make some quick notations but uh hey it, it's good you guys are there stay together Jason get ready to do, get, get ready to do my police report I'm gonna send you my uh, Google Slides presentation. Sure. All right, I'll, I'll talk to you guys later. See you next week. Steve is our guest next week for Satanism. So thank you, Steve. All right, you guys take it easy. Today. And and Chad, Chad, you served after Mike and and after Steve. How did you encounter religion in, in the service? Um, well, not none at the recruiting phase, uh, but definitely uh, immediately once uh, you get into basic training, uh, as soon as you go to the reception battalion before you even see your drill sergeants and you're getting issued all your stuff and your vaccinations and your head shaved, uh, it's you're getting Bibles, uh, they're making your your uh, you know quote unquote dog tags, and uh, you know I said I wanted atheists and they're like no. You are not getting that word. I, and it's civilian employees. And, you're, you know, you're in the deep south. And they're like, no, we're, we're not doing it. We'll put Christian. I'm like, no, you're, no, you're not. I was like, I am not a Christian. She's like, well, most people are. So that's what I'm putting. And I'm just like, I had to argue with this woman. And finally, like, kind of uh, haggled down to getting uh, no religious preference put on my dog tags. And uh so it's the same thing. So it's that environment. Your most of the, your peers are religious. The drill sergeants are, are. They didn't push religion on you, but when they needed a break, and they're like, "Oh, hey, you will have the opportunity to go to the chaplain, or the chapel," they're like, "Yeah, you're all going." And I'm just like, "No, I'd rather clean toilets." They're like, "No, no, you're going." <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it was forced on you, even at basic training. Um, yeah, going to airborne school, same thing. You'd get. New Testament pamphlets, uh, Christian pamphlets, uh, even stuff that was so vile. Uh, there was like, a, um, I don't recall the year, but there was a, a, an accident, uh, this one airborne unit, and a bunch of paratroopers died. And some Christians took that tragedy and made a pamphlet out of it saying, uh, 
creating this little fictitious story where one one of those dead paratroopers was floating up into the sky to go to heaven and he's looking down and seeing his other comrades uh actually the students like comrades uh fellow soldiers um going to hell because they didn't accept jesus christ as their savior and that's why all everyone in the military should be a christian and those things were allowed to float and be distributed freely throughout the airborne school. And then once, uh, you know, you get to your unit, um, I didn't encounter it when I was enlisted in the guard, really. I mean, we kind of usually just mocked uh, the chaplain who was just like this, you know, and some of the, the other goofy officers who uh, were just tr trying so hard to, you know, uh, give these little pep talks. But uh, when I was on active duty as an officer, it was, um, yeah, most units had their, their, their high priest that, you know, worked with the battalion commander and kind of like manipulated him from behind the scenes. And um, some units, they, they, it, there wasn't really a, a religious presence, but they're, they're every, every ceremony, there was a prayer, every award ceremony, every dinner, every function was always prayers that you had to take part in. Uh, but then units that did have a dedicated chaplain, then it was just like, he was always there behind the scenes trying to, you know, using the uh, battalion commander to manipulate things for his Christian agenda. Um, I did encounter a chaplain who was, for lack of a better word, open-minded, uh, or at least tolerant of other religions and um, would promote acceptance of other people and try to educate on uh, other faiths or lack of faiths and that were at least recognized by the Department of Defense. But he still hogged all the resources for his, his, uh, you know, his, his mythology. And, um, you know, and he even had an assistant who accidentally got somebody pregnant and instead of helping him, he basically got this, this poor young soldier kicked out of the, uh, the unit and, uh, and punished instead of being helped. So yeah, it's, it's always there. It's always present. You can go to any military installation and you just see these, these, temples of mostly christian you know churches built on every military base some are humongous and grandiose others are just little little cracker boxes but um but there's you know there's never going to be just one chapel or church on a military base so it's yeah it's an ever-present constantly there at every every function physically uh whether it's yeah whether it's a physical presence of a chaplain or a building or pamphlets or Bibles or in God we trust and God bless America being, you know, in, in a frame hung up on the walls. So it's, it's pretty much everywhere, but, um, uh, and what else? I don't know. Oh, I know. Yeah. We had a, a prop blast ceremony, which is an airborne unit thing. And I ended up making my own dog tags that said atheists. And when they saw that, cause they were handing out, uh, what was it? St. Michael medallions, who was like the patron saint of paratroopers. And they're like, oh, you're all going to get your little, your little idol. And I was just like a smirk and laughed. And they're like, looked at my dog tags. He's like, oh, well, you need two. So it, there was, there was that. It wasn't like even some, you know, just sometimes it was just this uh, little, you know, bullying or, but it was never any uh, direct hostility, but it was, uh, it was just one of those things that they were clearly like, yeah, you have to be a Christian. You should be, if you're not, you're in the wrong. And uh, so there was a lot of back talking, or not back talking, down talking about putting down Wiccans, putting it down Jews, putting down Hindus, putting down atheists. But um, but yeah, basically it was the Christian way or the highway. And that's it. Sorry to talk your ears off. Oh, this is why. Yeah, I'd like to uh, follow up a couple of that. Hey, Chad, haven't talked to you in years and years. Yeah, man, good to see you. I like the beard. One of the one of the one of the old school math members. You know, back in the back in the original days, twenty years ago, almost fifteen. Um, but yeah, this is you know, if if any of any of you are kind of outraged about about this, um, you know, there's two kind of sides to look at. One is again, the, the military chaplain corps, I think, is really the the backbone of political kind of fundamentalist Christianity in the United States. Really seditious kind of replace the Constitution with the Bible um, Christianity. That's terrible. Right. And, you know, we should work against that. But on the other side of the coin at the lower level, um, 
all these troops out in the world, they get this bad treatment because all the Christians think they can get away with it, right? They just, you know, I mean, I won't say in their defense, but like culturally speaking, they really honestly don't know any better. They've been raised with religion. They went into the military where they have, you know, paid, uniformed, high-ranking military officers who are officially Christian, like as a job with a salary. Um, and they think it's just fine. And they plaster their stuff everywhere, right? And they get a marketing budget, you know, to bring people into their unit. So, you know, I think the, the, the best, you know, longer term, but the only really way, way to do that is to let them know there are already decent foxholes. And, you know, MAF has done that in a, in a lot of ways with, you know, having humanist as an option, making sure atheist is available, um, you know, changing, you know, we've really changed like some of that, like no religious preference isn't there. It's like no preference. There's also none, there's atheist, there's humanist, you know, when these things are reported, we make sure they're visible. Um, but in your local community, you know, I mentioned a lot of different things, but Marine Corps recruit, recruit depot, San Diego, MCRD, San Diego, that's basic training for the Marines, you know, the West coast side. Um, it's, we don't have human services there, right? And we should, right? And I challenged Humanist Association of San Diego to make that happen. It's right there local to you. And what you need is three or four dedicated people to be there every Sunday or maybe Saturday or maybe Tuesday evening or whatever to be there every every week for those troops and to make that happen. And, and you know, and MAF will send you all the support that we can, but we've had that at, uh, the Navy area, and we kind of lost our volunteers, especially with COVID. Um, at Air Force, you know, there's some awesome volunteers, and they've got, you know, the majority of recruits showing up. And it's humanist services, but anybody can show up, um, you know, and there's a lot of secular stuff, but um, it's officially kind of humanist services, and they've got like thousands of people. It's literally the largest gathering of atheists in the world at any given time. Um, you know, with thousands of people at, at Air Force basic training. And it should be happening at every basic training area, but we need the volunteers that can dedicate the time for something that's really important to really connect with, with essentially kids every day, teach them these values that you're gonna talk about, you know, humanist values, and just to make sure they know, you know, they're there. And all those Christians out there, you know, they'll piss and moan, and they'll be mad about it, but as long as you're persistent and professional and, you know, not cursing at people and saying Christianity's stupid and, you know, the politics is bad, right? As long as you're there for them, talking about humanist values, doing a positive program, um, you know, we can get a foothold there. And it could be really, really awesome to kind of further, you know, for all of us, acceptance within, um, you know, within the larger culture. This is something I think we could do. I honestly think this is something that we can do. In, in our in our organization, in our community, we have one humanist celebrant. So I would be willing to get involved and help out. And we have many, many veterans in our, as you, as you can see in our community, and reaching out and doing that type of community outreach and service, especially with the youth, is something that is incredibly important. And I'm glad that you bring up the youth. In a moment, I'm going to hand this off to, to Craig, to, to further tell stories of, of humanists and atheists and foxholes, but something something doesn't seem to add up. And Jason, maybe you can um, expand upon this. While trying to look up the numbers of self-described non-theist in the military, I'm seeing numbers around 2%, 2.3%. And when we look at Rasmussen, Gallup, Pew, and we see the numbers of, of younger people because the majority of people in the military are under, under 40, there seems to be a, a disconnect from, from the numbers who are self-described atheist, non-theist, et cetera, et cetera, and, and those who are actually serving in the military. And I know that you brought this up um, a little bit, a little while ago, but if you can expand upon it more since we're talking about the youth, are there just less humanists and atheists in military service? If so, why? Or is it just a matter of underreporting? You, you've seen that slide. So basically, uh, yes, 2%, that's self-identified 
as atheists or humanists or none, right? Those are kind of the three atheist options, um, self-identified on their official records, on their dog tags for everybody in the world to see. So the reason the number is low is because of that. And we know it's low because 30% are unknown, right? Un you know, they didn't answer or there's, there's not a listing for that because it's not, it's not technically required. So, um, and then, and then that's separate from no preference or, or separate from like um, what Chad talked about, which is I said atheist and they gave me Christian instead and I just whatever, don't care enough to fix it, right? So there's a lot of that statistical grouping. Um, but yeah, and I think there's a certain um, focus on fascism, you know, that is more uh, attractive to your general purpose Christian and less attractive to your general, pur general purpose atheist, right? I don't want to that's just kind of a feeling I have. I don't have any social sciences on that, but you know, maybe you agree. Um, so, so the numbers I think are a little bit depressed relative to the general population, you know, for ethical reasons. Um, and then, but they're massively depressed because people don't want to out themselves, you know, in a community that's very obviously oppressively Christian. So. We have one person on the chat right now, Laura, who said that she just messaged her son, who's currently serving in Iraq, to ask what his dog tag says. And he replied, atheist. Chad. Uh, yeah, I forgot to bring up, um, you know, as I mentioned, in going through basic training uh, when I enlisted, you know, fighting to get atheists put on my dog tags. But uh, when I was a, a cadet uh, going through Army ROTC and then had to go to these uh, various uh, you know, evaluation uh, camps at different military bases. And one was at Fort Bragg. Um, I was just like, you know what? I don't feel like dealing with the hassle of these other idiot cadets and how they're just so petty and backstabbing. So I was like, all right, I can have, they said, what do you want on your dog tag? So as a goof, I put like earth spiritualist just to, just to be funny, you know, cause I, it was like a joke only I got. Um, but I, then I didn't have to deal with people going oh my god you're an atheist how could you uh but they would just be like oh what's that oh i'm curious what is that what does that mean i would just like you know just kind of just toy with them uh in that sense so there, there's probably like jason mentioned there's a lot of you know like sometimes you just don't want to deal with the flack uh from from these bigots and you just you know like hey i'll just take it off my tags uh i just won't talk about it i won't mention it i'll take and make sure it's never comes up on my record uh, so that was one incident, you know, for me personally, where I was just like, you know what, for the, the, this month, I, I, uh, I'm going to be at another installation in this kind of evaluation scenario with a bunch of people I know are going to be driving me crazy as it is. And I just don't need to, to have another thing to, you know, for them to bug me about. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, I mean, I think that's good. That's a good example. Like, uh, to give you, you know, more specific, um, or just another another specific example that you know was my experience in airborne school. It wasn't the tag specifically, but you know we're in airborne school. We're getting ready to do our first jump, um, and the chaplain comes up and says, "There's no atheist at the end of static lines." So static line is kind of what pulls your chute for you in airborne school because troops are dumb and you can't trust them to do it themselves. Um, but you know, so he said that, and like I wanted to be, "Hey, screw you, jerk! What about me?" Uh, and complain and make a big deal about it. But, but the fact is airborne school is not basic training. They're not, you know, you can't just like continue, right? It's dangerous, right? And because of these static lines, it's a long, you know, it's, you can like tear off your friend's face, right? If you don't do it right, right? You, it's very dangerous for the people in front of you and behind me. Uh, I was actually super afraid even at that time because the person in front of me and the person behind me were morons. And they couldn't figure it out how to like do this handoff right. And I don't want my face torn off. So they actually both got thrown out before the first jump. So I was not wrong in how much of a moron they are because it's not that hard. Um, you have to be able to hand and turn at the same time. But but I couldn't say anything because you can get thrown out of airborne school for anything. You know, they don't even have to have a reason. Just, oh, you didn't make it, bye. And it's very important. It's an extremely important you know, milestone or like award, a badge, a, a skill set that, that, you know, to acquire within the military. And, and it was just too much pressure to, to speak up and say, 
hey, I don't appreciate you lying and you know disparaging me. Um, and it's a short three week thing and I just had to let it go and I shouldn't have had to. And that's that kind of thing happened all the time, all the time for a million reasons. And it's just extra pressure that the troops shouldn't have to put up with. And they, they'll have to put up less, you know, to the extent they know they have, you know, somebody, you know, like math and like humanist association of San Diego who has their back. So I have two other questions before I, I hand this off to Craig. So to bring up chaplains again, there are 2,900, about 2,900 chaplains in, in the service. And my apologies if I bring up anything that was on a previous slide, I'd like to go into this a little bit. With 2,900 chaplains, how do we not have a humanist chaplain? How do we not have one? And I'm asking that question, not, not just to be rhetorical, but also looking at the fact that in the Supreme Court case from 1963, which was about notary publics that, that said that much like um, Buddhists, secular humanists are a branch of religions that don't teach the existence of a God. So according, at least in the eyes of the Supreme Court, secular humanism is considered a religion under the eyes of the government. So looking at how we're recognized as a religious grouping under the eyes of government. How do we not have the humanist chapter? And how, what can uh, we do Yeah, that? so, I mean, the reason is like, first of all, it's hard, right? You have to have um, credentials within the humanist community, which it took us, you know, several years to build, you know, and, and those individuals have to have credentials. Um, the second thing is you have to have a master of divinity degree, two years, which, you know, it sounds bad, but on the other hand, even though it's not like, you know, science degree or, or something we might prefer better, it's, you're still associated with religion all the time. That's the service you're providing, even if you're connecting people with others. So it's hard to do. So any individual has to baby, basically commit to a career um, that, you know, where all of their colleagues are going to be hostile to them. Uh, you know, or essentially all of their colleagues and their and their superiors and whatnot. So it's hard to find a good candidate. Uh, but we did have a fully qualified candidate, and uh, the military basically just made up excuses and lied and drug feet and through the power of the Department of Defense legal system to make sure that that candidate was, you know, shoved to the side and not accepted. So to the extent we get another candidate, that will be fine. Um, but what I would encourage everyone is not to fixate on a humanist chaplain, right? That'll be great if there's somebody, and the only reason, you know, that we supported at the time was not, you know, I mean, that would be a great thing, but we were supporting that individual's, you know, opportunity to build their career. Um, the more important focus is actually not 20, 2,900, it's 5,000, you know, chaplains in the Department of Defense. Those 5,000 chaplains need to do just as much for humanists as they do for Christians and Catholics and Jews and even Hindus and Buddhists. If they did as much for humanists and other non-theists as they do for Wiccans, we wouldn't really have anything to complain about. There are no Wiccan chaplains either. So um, there are actually no Hindu chaplains right now either. And if they did as much for us as they do for all of them, those 5,000 chaplains with their government salary and their rank and their uniform and their marketing budget and their assistance, they need to be using those for everybody, not just to kind of better support the majority, you know, power, you know, Christians and Catholics that already have 27 churches in the local area. So, so focus on those 5,000 chaplains who are not helping us rather than trying to have somebody from our community have to like switch careers and do all this effort, you know, to be one you know, chaplain in the entire U.S. military. Does that make sense? No, Chad. Uh, yeah, just to add on to that, uh, you know, this uh, the the quest for a uh, a humanist chaplain is is relatively new. Also, it's only, geez, less than twenty years. I mean, I remember bringing this up back in the uh, old math uh, online email discussions, and um, you know, when when uh, humanism was recognized under the Department of Defense as being a you know a, acknowledged or recognized a religious or they considered to be a religious group uh but yeah it's it's uh they say okay we'll recognize you know your right to be acknowledged but they again they had this extremely biased criteria like well you have to 
jump through the same hoops, uh, you know, you have to have these re religious credentials to be uh, have a non-religious position. So, uh, and then and again, they can set up other obstacles to, to set you up for failure as well. So that 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 also adds to why you know we don't have one. Plus, uh, the dominating force of uh, this monopoly of uh, you know Christianity having a a death grip on a uh, on the military itself, which brings up another question of whether even having U.S. military officer chaplains having basically high, high priests within the military who have officer ranks uh, that they didn't really earn and uh, a budget to carry out rituals and proselytize and recruit and uh, so on and so forth. Is that even constitutional? Like, does that violate the establishment clause? Um, as opposed to having like, should every unit have uh, a therapist or you know so, some type of a like a social worker of sorts, uh, a morale officer that's trained in psychology and therapy and social work to help, rather than somebody who's going to say, well, I'm going to say do some magical spells for you. You can recite these mantras, you know, read these ancient passages, and uh, maybe you know I'll give you the blood of my demigod. And that'll fix all your problems. Like, if this, it's it, there's there's other things we should be looking at um, as well. But yeah, these are also things I think we should be uh, considering. Not just why is it that we don't have uh, a representative, and but should we? Well, like, what and what kind of representative? Should they be military officers? Should they be civilian employees? Uh, you know, it's, there's a lot here to to, to discuss uh, beyond like why we're being underrepresented or misrepresented. Uh, or not having uh, uh, an insider to, to take care of the needs of, of uh, the various military personnel, whether it's atheist or any other personnel that uh, is in the military. Thanks. Yeah, and I think in, you know, what Chad says is right, when he talks about what does that representative look like, right? You know, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, big brick, bridge to cross to get to therapist, but you, I mean, you guys, this, this uh, recruit depot, um, basic training for for uh, um, Marine Corps basic training. Um, what you un have to understand is the chaplains that are there, their job is to facilitate and support religious activities, right? Which, you know, humanism qualifies. Um, you know, humanism does, religion doesn't equal God, it equals core values and beliefs. And we'll talk about that more, you know, with your volunteers. But most of what they do is connecting outside ministries, you know, which is essentially, you know, what this is to the, to the troops. They don't perform all those services. They call the local church and they send the Protestant men of the choir and the local Bible study. And they send the, you know, the, you know, whatever it is and all the Jewish groups and, and the, you know, they call the temple, the Buddhist temple and the Buddhist guy comes in and does some Buddhist stuff, or they call the Wiccan guy and the, and the civilian, you know, uncredentialed, just kind of verified and vetted by the chaplain you know, because that's his job comes in and does that stuff. And that's you guys, right? You, you know, they vet you and, and the human MAF and American Human Association, Human Association of San Diego as its own organization, all vet your volunteers and say, hey, these guys are good guys. And if they screw up, you kick them out and we'll maybe pick somebody else. Um, you know, that vetting of people like you, those are our representatives. And that's the best way to kind of um, provide for those troops, not trying to get a human, you know, and, and that's what I mean by make all those 5,000 military chaplains do their job. Their job is to call you and provide authentic support, not to sit down and, you know, have a quasi, you know, talk um, with them. They, they're supposed to call you. Thank you. And Chad, thank you for asking that question and addressing that aspect of should we even have a chaplain as opposed to replacing that service with a more secular professional service like social workers, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health workers. Um, I, I myself am an assertive secularist and I think that it would be a more appropriate use of funds and perhaps a more appropriate use of, 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 of troops and resources. And my last question before I turn it over to Craig, sometimes we hear about certain, certain higher ups within the military um, such as um, Air Force Brigadier General E. John Tykert and Lieutenant General um, Jerry Boykin, 
using their positions to evangelize and give an evangelical impression of the military by giving uh, the impression that the military is a Christian organization. Um, how often, how often does does MAP receive complaints about 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 higher ups, colonels, generals, major generals, admirals, and how can MAP help members uh, who are serving currently um, with such complaints? I mean, it's it's no different than than what we've talked about. We provide care packages, the knowledge that there's a national, you know, global community through MAP that. Um, is like that are like them um and and just tell them hey it's it's hard you know because uh the fundamentalists do have a lot of power right and a lot of senior power and jerry boykins is a psycho right he's, he's way off the deep end so you know that's that's pretty extreme i mean even even among christians like they would say that guy's like really out there um but uh what what we're talking about is the solution is to build is to make sure that they know that the the people who are serving know that even though the military is, you know, aggressively like over the top fundamentalist right now that there is a civilian community that can support and there are veterans and people who've been there that can identify with them and help them and help them work through, you know, to get their job done. And the more you make a presence on those military installations, the more those other Christians will know they, they just can't get away with that stuff anymore. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things that, that go on that, that really, you know, they'll be more embarrassed to do it when they know that they're not the only game in town. You know, they, I mean, they're not really bad people, right? You know, some of them are. Jerry Boykin is, you know, certainly a, a, you know, a bad person as far as I can tell, right? Speaking in broad terms, but most of them are just, they're just Christian because everybody's Christian. That's always, that's the way it's always been, right? And to the extent they see atheists and humanists all around them all the time doing their thing, then, you know, they'll be less likely to just kind of assert their beliefs and assume that that's just the way it ought to be. Thank you. And I'm going to turn this over to Craig now, who has served in the military, to, to facilitate a discussion, a further discussion of going deeper into people's stories who have served in the military or from military families. I would hope that, that Laura would, would talk about being a military mom and about um, talking to her son right now while we're on, um, on the chat. So Craig, I'm handing this over to you. Okay. Yeah, um, I definitely wanna find out more from families and spouses too. Um, I'm just gonna can give you my experience because it's gonna counter to a lot of what you've heard. Um, you know, I was raised in the Episcopal church and I was an avid Boy Scout. So for me, at the time period I went in the service, I found the army to be quite secular uh, compared to what I was used to, you know, um, I just feel as it was a reflection of society. I think since that time, there's been probably more push towards evangelism, but it was, um, it was kind of an insincere institution when I was in, I mean, my exposure was in basic training. Uh, and Mike has spoken how you're really regimented and you have almost no time. And when you're an introvert, uh, you welcome the chance to go to the church. In fact, everybody went every week. They didn't pay attention at all. It could have been a dusty old barn. It was just a recharge time because it was a drill sergeant free zone. And so there was nothing like negative about it. People want to just go there to get their hour away from, you know, from, from the drill sergeants. And nobody remembered a word was said and half of them slept through it anyway. Um, when I went on uh, to my overseas duty station, uh, I was in a remote air defense site and uh, I never heard Hyder, you know, tell anything about religion. Uh, we didn't have a chapel, we didn't have a barber, we didn't have a bank. Uh, and there was just complete disinterest in that institution. The only time I went to church was when I was best man at somebody's wedding. Um, so for me, it was really just a reflection of the times. It was in the early 80s, mid 80s. And even though the evangel evangelical movement was, was happening in the United States, it really hadn't taken a hold. But keep in mind, too, that, you know, I'm just one person with one tour. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert in this topic. I just um, 
that was my experience. Um, and uh, I would kind of like to know more from people's problems they've had if they felt that um, their difficulties were based on an institutional, institutionally enforced, or if they considered the abuse just by authority of individuals or maybe a clique. Because I could see where at a bigger post uh, or in a, maybe in a more combat situation, if you have people in leadership that want to take you in one direction, they're going to have sort of the authority to do so. So I don't really have any personal stories of any issues. Um, but if people don't have any input, especially spouses or families as well, uh, do they feel that that was something that was driven from individuals? Or was it something that was really established in uh, institutionally? So Laura, if you have anything you would like to say, I'd love to hear. Chad, go ahead, Chad. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, no, thank you for that. Um, and again, I just want to throw in a little anecdotal thing that I forgot to mention, uh, the issue of the promise keepers. And the, uh, the, in addition to the evangelical movement, there's also the, the Christian dominionist movement that, you know, the Christian man has to be in charge of his, his uh, of himself, be in charge of his family, be in charge of his town, be in charge of his unit, be in charge of the, the country. And that's the Christian man should control all these things and dominate the planet in the name of Christianity. And that there's a huge movement uh, that seems to be very popular in the military, uh, this ideology and i was just wondering if anybody if it was relevant uh to this and if anybody else wanted to touch up on it uh i think jason probably knows a little bit about this also thanks okay that's a good point yeah i i saw that uh what you put in the in the chat uh jason definitely um there's a provision for religion absolutely where i was there wasn't a provision for anything <laughs> uh, but like i said just because the unit size i was in so, but uh, was there anyone that has family members or spouses or anything like that that would like to uh, relay their experiences as well? Because theirs is just as valid. You're in the institution as well, just so to speak. Yeah, hi, this is Laura. So um, I actually, yes, my son is in Iraq. He's in the Air Force and um, I think like Craig said, you know, my son was a boy scout. So my son, you know, grew up, you know, he was, he had already had that kind of discrimination to some extent through, you know, just school and um, being in scouts and stuff like that, where he just didn't talk about it much. Um, he, he didn't hide it. He was very upfront that he was um, atheist and grew up in a secular household, but um, you know he didn't really push it in anyone's face, and he just kind of um, got used to living in a Christian society. So that's why it was cu curious to me. I was I um, sent him a Facebook message while I was listening to you guys saying, "What is your what your dog tag say?" And he said, "Atheist, of course." <laughs> and so, um, but I think also. Um, he's in the Air Force, and I think that maybe they're not quite as militant about um, Christianity, maybe as some of the other, or maybe it's just he's in a he's in a special operations base um, where he is um, he's a linguist, and so he is a support for special operations. So I don't think it would serve them well to be teasing him about being an atheist since they're pretty dependent on his knowledge, whether they get out of something safely. So um, that could have something to do with it as well. Um, I, I do remember him writing to me from boot camp, you know, and telling me that he was forced to go to some kind of a religious service every Sunday, uh, which was kind of, uh, I said, what, you can't sleep in? I thought that'd be your day off. And he said, oh no, we all have to do something. But he, he went to the Wiccan, you know, and he went to, he just kind of spread it around and went to a different thing every week just to see what, what that was all about, just to break up the boredom. But um, 
that's I don't you know he doesn't talk a lot about it and I don't think it's a big deal um for him at least in his service um I have two stepsons as well they're also both atheists and one's in uh, one's a coast guard pilot and I don't think it's an issue for him and the other one was in the army and he's now a jag and I don't think that that was ever an issue either but I'm not sure they had atheists printed on their um on their dog tags. Um, I, I had kind of a crappy experience with Blue Star Mothers um, that, you know, I joined a Blue Star Mothers group when my son first went into boot camp and I thought, oh yeah, this will be great. You know, I'll have the support of all these other moms. And it was really, uh, I did not like the experience at all. It was um, besides them being um, not exactly, politically on my same agenda. Uh, you know, we, I was a treasurer for the group. I volunteered to be the treasurer. And then I didn't realize, you know, being sworn in, there was all kinds of religious crap in this swearing and ceremony, which I just was kind of, oh my God, rolling my eyes about the whole time. And it just, um, I felt, I don't know that I felt that it was overly Christian, but it was, we were supposed to say a prayer before each meeting and um it just was uncomfortable so i ended up you know dropping out of that i just didn't feel like it was it was my group and i didn't feel you know welcome or comfortable there there's, there's a lot of ceremony in the military i remember uh going through uh primarily primary leadership development uh course in germany and uh you know they graduate there's a, there's all kinds of symbology you know the people that run it do it every month and they just kind of insincerely insincerely push the button and kind of walk away so you know if you paid close attention to it um or it was offensive to you it would probably bother you more i think most people just kind of roll their eyes at it mm -hmm. uh just being routine and like i said it really has a lot to do with the time you're in you know the time i was in the symbology was actually a step down from what i was used to so uh, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I definitely want to relate to what's happening, but it's hard for me personally to recall anything, um, to that nature. You know, I, I hear a lot of like, you know, no big deal. Right. But I think probably, you know, you recall like your oath church yeah. on Sundays, every single ceremony prayers before and after. Right. That stuff adds up. Right. And and I think it's a matter of perspective because a lot of people, you know, are kind of used to it more. It doesn't bother them as much, especially if they're kind of religious as, as it comes in. Um, but it's ever present. It's systematic. You know, you remember seeing chaplains with crosses on their uniform walking around everywhere. Right. You remember, you know, them kind of promoting their agenda and, and what they had to say to everybody. Um, you remember them. They had the commander's ear. Right. They're on staff. For every every commander, you know, not at the lowest level, but it kind of two steps up from the lowest level has, um, or one step up depending on where the commanders start, uh, has a chaplain assigned to them, you know, with their ear, and the installations do too, which is separate from the command chain. So, you know, I and this isn't a specific experience, but I can tell you that every single person in the military has a consistent experience of being pressured to do a religious oath, being uh, brought in, you know, being told to go to church every, every Sunday um, and having many, many military ceremonies frequently all the time for, all, for everything with prayers starting and ending every single one of those ceremonies. And they have the experience of their commanders, again, you know, one or two up probably, having a Christian almost certainly on their staff, a paid uniformed senior officer on staff of their commander and their commander's commander and the commander's commander's commander, all having this kind of, you know, hierarchy of Christianity, you know, 98% of chaplains are Christian. So it's not like there weren't any Jews there, but like basically 98% of chaplains are Christian. So it's just, you know, if you say, well, I, I don't really remember, I, I just, you know, I do want to remind you it was there. It was everywhere all the time and, and you saw it. 
that's the experience for every single person in the military, even if somebody didn't come up and say, hey, you're a dirty atheist, I hate you, you're fired, right? Or you're demoted or whatever, right? That, that you know, direct discrimination might not have happened, but that systematic, institutionalized um, evangelism was there for everyone. Well, remember, I, I was at a remote site. I never did see a chaplain, ever. So, I mean, I, I'm saying I want to understand what's going on is, in my experience, was very unique because I was in a technical field. And even if the chaplain had shown up, I probably would not have seen him because I was on 24 Manning. So, um, then we never had prayers or anything like that conducted by our local officers. Like I said, it was kind of a disinterest. So I'm sure my situation was kind of unique in that, but I did I did go through that in basic training. Um, so, so there's there's a question that comes to mind, and then we'll go to Keith and then Chad. Considering that there is such a a ubiquity of, of prayer in, in, in Christendom within the military, at a cultural level at least. What does that mean for, for the troops when they go into an area like a, a theater like Afghanistan where the majority of the people are not Christian? What does it mean for a, a situation like Afghanistan? Does this have an effect of increasing a sense of tribalism and competition where you, you diminish the quote unquote enemy because they're, they're Muslim or in World War II in Japan where the majority of people still aren't Christian. How does that impact or is there an impact of, 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 of a difference in, in religions between the troops which are generally Christian and, and the targeted and supposed adversaries? Go ahead, Jason. I I would assume so, but I would like no, to yeah, all of that. Um, I mean, I see, you know, sometimes it's aggressive, uh, and then sometimes it's just general dehumanizing. I mean, you know, there's nothing really to, there's no real details to give on that, but it's a real problem. And remember, you know what happens, you know what happens if they get converted? Their friends kill them, right? So all this evangelism and handing out Bibles and little coins and, you know, Jesus will save you, you know, there's, there's, there's another side of that where, you know, troops trying to convert locals, you know, that means they're, they're not just like not, not Muslim anymore, they're apostates and then they kill them. So, so this is a, a danger to local community as well as being, you know, both from their own community as well as, you know, this general dehumanizing and, um, you know, war crime danger. Thank you so much, Keith. A comment on that. So, are atheists more, um, <clears throat> uh, let's say, looking upon the Muslims better than the Christians would? I mean, don't you equally um, denigrate Muslims as Christians? Right. You look, both of them are ignorant and unintelligent from your from an atheist perspective, anyway. So, but where it's Christian doctrine to love your enemy, and if your enemy's hungry, feed him. And nobody's know, saying that, Keith. No, no, I'm just saying, saying no, that, that, no, I'm just saying that you, what's the difference between Muslim to a atheist, a Muslim or a Christian from a belief standpoint is exactly the same, right? Both are equally wrong. I think there's more Those cultural are, things going on besides just their religious belief that they can be denigrated for. Sure. And then if a, if a Muslim makes a decision to become a Christian, it's obviously not a light decision to make knowing that he might be killed by his family. So if they actually make that decision, it, it's not something that they would do lightly, number one. But my other point to Ron is like, I guess it's a good thing that all these Christians are willing to die for their country <clears throat> to benefit all the other people, whether they believe in Christ or not, or, or any religion, right? They're dying for their country regardless of the beliefs and the history that I put it up before. Yep, so there were chaplains in the military going back to the Revolutionary War when it was primarily, right, the war was primarily planned in churches and with Christians and everything like that. So we all get that benefit, whether we believe or not. There's not a requirement to believe in God to receive the benefit of all the Christians who gave their lives. And uh, as Lincoln said, right, fed the, what was it, Lincoln, that uh, their blood watered the tree of liberty, 
right? So a Christian, a Christian uh, belief is liberty, right? So built into the constitution is that our creator has endowed us with certainly inalienable rights that I would fight for the right of atheists to not believe in God and to talk about it and not be persecuted when speaking against the God that the people formed the country believed in, right? So this is what freedom is all about. It's a, while you don't believe in you know, Christianity and that's fine, the fact that you're free to do so is a result of Christians' beliefs. There are people around the world who are free without that. Uh, and by the way, uh, well, your you don't freedom, win a war. Though, their freedom, don't... I don't know what got their freedom, but your freedom was paid for with the blood of Christians. I, don't, I can't speak to other countries. but I'll American make a correction freedom. there, Keith. You don't win a war <clears throat> by giving your life. You win a war by making the other guy give his life. Thank you. Yes, General Patton's very intelligent. It's a great euphemism. Make the other poor bastard give his life. I, I understand, but you have to be willing to give your life. Yes, the idea is it better if no soldiers die. That kind of, yeah, that that's obvious, right? If all 100% of our soldiers died, we wouldn't win the war. So that's that's really a non sequitur, right? Of course, but they were willing to give their lives what they believed in. <clears throat> they did not require anybody afterwards to believe what they believed in to call themselves an American, right? To have that freedom, you did not have to believe what they believed. So. You know, I know you say that the, the, the Christians that are proselytizing, they're, you know, I guess, I mean, if you really believe in, in your atheist belief, it's, you're not challenged much by a Christian proselytizing. Hey, Keith, right? so, Keith you're, way, you're way off base here from start to finish. So I don't know if anybody else wants to listen to this, but it's just, it's kind of ridiculous. And, and I don't know, I, I'm not particularly interested in, in hearing, hearing somebody tell me, about, tell me all the favors Christians did, did to me. So I should just ignore them, you know, trying to force their beliefs on me, right? It's not, you know, it's not okay um, that Christians have built a military um, institution to exploit kids to, to adopt their beliefs, right? That's not free, Wait, that's kids. not okay, and it's not, um, it, it's not something that, that anybody should be sitting here saying I, saying I should appreciate. Fair enough. All right. Thank but you. my contrary opinion is not okay. Nope. We could talk about it longer some other day, but probably not not in this forum. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Keith. Chad. Yes. Uh, thanks. Um, just uh, you know, thanks, Jason. Uh, I, I agree one hundred percent with uh what you just said. Um, you know, we you know Christianity also gave us manifest destiny uh, and some other a lot of other unfortunate military uh conquests in the name of uh you know the white quick christian race as they put it but um going back to um where were we i'm trying to get back on topic sorry uh yeah as far as the the being in the middle east and uh looking at people religion being used um uh, to condemn you know the other uh i don't have any you know i wasn't i didn't get deployed to the middle east but I engaged with a lot of people that were I had served with uh, in the past, and you know, and then engaging with people online, uh, debating, discussing, arguing, and there seemed to be a huge, um, for lack of a better word, a, a neo crusader movement within the military. That uh, I'm trying to think of the phrase was it is a Deus vault. Um, and you know, using up, bringing up the uh, Crusader imagery, and guys buying Crusader helmets and getting uh, Christian tattoos. Uh, ironically, some of them having the word "infidel," uh, not real. You know, Christians doing this, not realizing that <laughs> that you know that uh, Christians, it's, they're, it's a Christian word that means those without faith, and they're just you know the Muslims appropriated it. Um, so it's 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 really bizarre. I don't know what percentage of the military uh, had that mentality. Um, and I don't even know if there's any uh, any hard evidence to that can calculate like what percentage uh, might be out there that that it had this 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 um, this Christian imperialist uh, crusader mentality uh, as far as this, this subgroup or, or for lack of a better word, a sect within the military, and whether that was being uh, condemned or or encouraged by the chaplain corps or different chains of command, because um, I think an important point I want to bring up is that 
those of us who were in the military understand the environment, but from uh, an outsider looking in, just that it's kind of like, um, I'll bring it, it's something that was blatantly obvious for the rest of us, but it's a hierarchy. And you, you kind of take for granted when you're, you're on an outsider looking in that when you go in, it's not like your nine to five job. It's not like going to college. You, you are immersed in this environment where it's a completely different society with a, a, a complete hierarchy pyramid. And those at the top are the officers. And those officers go to, not all of them go to military academies, but those military academies are dominated by Christianity and Christian rituals. And when you get in, there's also a, a hundred, over a hundred years of precedence set that this is a Christian military with Christian chaplains and churches and rituals and prayers. Uh, that dominate the military experience. And then these new officers come in to this environment, they uphold that. And when you're a private and you come in and you rise up through the ranks to become a non-commissioned officer, you're just like, well, I guess this is the way it is. And if, and if I happen to be on that side of the team uh, or I'm on that, I'm on team Christian, team Jesus, I'm gonna uphold uh, this, this environment. Uh, and, and to hell with anybody else who, who says that uh, we should change. So. It's, it's, it's a difficult <laughs> battle, it's a, so to speak, to, 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 to fight. Um, yeah, it, you're dealing with a, and you know, when whatever habits you, you've seen, got, you know, uh, people come in, you, you incorporate the habits of the, of the people you're with, because it's, it's just, uh, you know, when you wanna talk about like group psychology and uh, social contagion and things like that, uh, all those things come into play uh, and that makes this a, a persistent habitual, uh, a loss of words uh phenomena i guess thanks thank you so much so i have i have a another question we're coming up on three o'clock pacific and there's there's one question that i want to ask and i'm cutting it a little short for the sake of time and um it goes down to the aspect of, of the humanist philosophy in practice. Um, in, in the second draft of the Humanist Manifesto that came out in 1973, Paul Kurtz writes, the world community must renounce the resort to violence and force as a method of solving international, and force as a method of solving international disputes. We believe in the peaceful adjudication of differences by international courts and by the development of the arts of negotiation and compromise. War is obsolete, so is the use of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. It is a planetary imperative to reduce the level of military expenditures and turn these savings to peaceful and people-oriented uses. There's also something that I want to bring up before I ask my question. And it's a, sort of a two-part question, and I would love Jason's answer on this. Um, this, is, this is in Christian philosophy. It's called just war theory. It's about when it's legitimate to use force to take the lives of other people. Do you think there's a humanist just war theory? And also, and this is for Craig, and this is, and, I, and, and I'm, giving, I'm giving preference to the answers from people who have served on this day before Memorial Day. Owing to our ethical and philosophical tenets and precepts, should humanists enlist or otherwise seek commissions in military service? So two part question, is, is there a humanist just war theory? And should, should humanists sign up? So I yes. think that was to me. So this is uh, juice and bellow and juice at bellum, you know, uh, reasons, ways to act appropriately and ethically in war and reasons to go to war in the first place. Um, and so that theory is important. And in summary, you know, without going into every single argument, I was at the Oslo uh, International Humanist Conference, and I think it was 2011, maybe. Um, and that was a conference on peace. So this is an international humanist conference on peace. And I was on stage with a couple of other um, 
uh, speakers. One of them was a French pacifist. The other one I think was a Dutch pacifist. So when we were having the same discussion and the line of questioning was basically the same. And even the French pacifist said, yes, of course there are good reasons to go to war um, and to serve in war and for humanists to, to seek out, you know, to engage in military service. So the difficult question is, um, and this is the, the second part of the answer, the difficult question is when you're serving in the military, uh, it's a very difficult thing because people always say, hey, what would you die for, right? That's a softball question. Oh, I die for my family and I die for freedom and I die for this. And, you know, it's real easy to say, it's certainly harder to do in practice, but, but the question itself is, is kind of a softball. What would you die for? Then there's what would you kill for, right? I'd, uh, you know, I'd kill somebody who's trying to harm my family or I'd kill somebody who was trying to kill somebody, else, right? That's a harder question, right? Because you actually have to like go and kill somebody, right? Which should be a hard thing to do, right? But serving in the military is not just what would you kill for it? What would you proxy kill for? Who would you kill for? So when you serve in the military, you're putting your life on the line. People focus on that. But you're also saying, I'm going to pick up arms and go and shoot a stranger because my boss told me to, right? And that's like a crazy, you know, ethical situation to put yourself in. But there are so, so many of those, you know, even from a humanist perspective, or at least from my perspective, there are pacifists in the world, but, um, you know, even again, at this French pacifist, at the Oslo humanist community, we're, you know, I was kind of engaging and walking through this discussion. And, and he's just like, yeah, of course, there's lots of good reasons. Um, and just the last point is, the way I kind of frame it, and you know, maybe there's better ways, but there are commercial reasons to go to war, right? Oh, we can get money, we can get oil, we can get this and that. There are imperial reasons to go to war, like basically the entire Cold War. We have to stop Russia from, you know, taking more places because democracy is better than communism, and or you know, trying to expand territory. Those are imperial reasons to go to war. Then there's humanitarian reasons to go to war, you know. Hitler is killing Jews, so we should take, you know, we should stop him from doing that. Or, um, you know, some warlord in Mali is, you know, and I don't know, there's a actually a coup and another counter coup in Mali right now. Um, and I don't know what the situation is, maybe Nigeria or Uganda. You know, there, there are these situations, these humanitarian crises, Yemen, you know, I talk about a lot of Africa, but um, there are reasons to go out and kill bad people because there are bad people in the world and there are good people under their thumb. Uh, so that's, um, again, not relying on my own, but there was a peace conference and you know, ever serving in war was certainly not on the table. That It wasn't a pacifist conver conference and that was an international humanist and ethical union conference. And so I kind of trust their judgment. Um, but again, from my perspective, it's just important to ask yourself, is this a humanitarian reason? Are we, are we here to defend people? Are we taking life to defend life or are we taking life, you know, to get money or power or something like that, right? And that's, you know, hopefully simplifies the discussion a little bit more. I would add, you know, from sort of more of a pragmatic view, the military being a very sophisticated machine and not just a machine, but the cost is in running it and crewing it and training it requires a lot of continuity. And I think those uh, capabilities that are in society and opportunities that are given back to young people need to be shared equally um, on a volunteer basis. And some people are going to uh, gain and provide a lot of service to their country through the military. Others are gonna do so by uh, other civic duties, uh, emergency responders, I think everyone can uh, serve their country. Um, people always say the military gives you freedom. I sometimes qualify that and say, no, you do as a participant in your society, all the way from school board, all the way up to federal government. And, um, you know, you have to have a well-oiled machine ready to go. It's too late when you need it. Uh, it's like a police officer with a service weapon will probably never discharge that weapon in his entire career, but it's got to be there. You can't order it when he thinks he might need it. And that's kind of the way the military, as you see, 
it's, it needs continuity, it needs to be run, and it needs to be understood uh, by everyone in society. Um, they either need to accrue it, fund it, or understand its capability. And I think that's a responsibility of everybody, whether you're actually serving or not. So um, I think that if you're calling or that's an opportunity that you can uh, uh, benefit from and give back to society, I think that should be available. And the, the number of people, uh, I mean, it's, it's dangerous, it's a lot of work, but it's not the most dangerous job and it's not the hardest job to do either. Um, so I think this idea that you're all going to be killed is, is that's, you know, I don't know, statistically, it's just not gonna happen. Now, are you going to be put into a situation where you might have to kill? Uh, not everyone really is. Uh, you know, I was a radar and missile technician. I was probably three layers back from making a decision to kill anybody. I was probably further back than a lot of civilians are in having to make that decision. But I played a key role um, in, in keeping that equipment running. And, you know, it's not something you can do overnight. Uh, the job I did took over a year school uh, to learn. And I took that education further when I got back out and, and had a successful career in, in electronics and telecommunications and retired at 55. So um, when Zem, I, I was going to ask you, I was going to answer one of your questions. You know, people say, is it okay to say thank you for your service? Like that was a question you had. Um, a lot of us have come back safely and the benefit we receive far exceeded what we put in, even though what we put in seemed overwhelming at the time. There are other people who don't make it home. So it's a very hard question to answer. For me, I feel a little bit funny because I feel like about this big on the scale of having contributed. Um, but that's something that's diminished over time because I've lived a long and successful life. When I was closer to being in the service, um, yes, I would have appreciated that more. If I'd walked through the airport, I would have appreciated <laughs> uh, that acknowledgement, but less so as I get older. Chad. Uh, yeah, uh, just want to quickly say, oh, ho hopefully it'll be quickly, um, you know, taking up the uh, choosing to, to stand up for others, to, to uh, take on the lifestyle of being a guardian, to be, uh, just, you know, quote unquote, uh, stand at the gate uh, or on that wall, uh, as far as the different metaphors that are used. Uh, yeah, that's honorable. It's, um, it's, a, it's a good thing. I think that's a, definitely a humus, humanist thing. Um, but, you know, serving in the one military is gonna different, why very, differently from one country to another uh, and one era uh, from one era than another. So whether you're in the United States or Switzerland, or you can be in the United States during the, the 20s, the 40s, the 50s, the 90s, the 2000, uh, you know, the war on terror was definitely different than World War II, definitely different than the Spanish-American War. So it, it means different things when to be in the military and to, you know, to quote unquote serve and who are you serving that's the real question. Are you serving the country? Or as uh, Eisenhower, you know, brought up the, that great phrase, uh, the, you know, the military industrial congressional complex. Um, because in my opinion, I, you know, I spent seven years in the military. I don't feel like I served my country. I, looking back after doing an analysis and, and having a more of a, a greater knowledge of foreign policy and the history of uh, the military and, and our military budget, uh, yeah, I, f I feel like I served the military industrial complex. I felt like when I got out and I became more involved in the process and in society and trying to engage with politicians and representatives, that's when I felt like I was really serving my country. Um, and to, to another thing that Eisenhower said, as far as uh, he said, every gun that's made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft uh, from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. The world, uh, the world in arms is not spending money alone. So it's something to, to, to consider. Uh, 
you know, when you talk about the whole grand thing as far as humanism, uh, you know, standing up to protect others and even engage in a fight for a noble cause is very honorable. And I, I really think that ties into humanist values. But uh, as we all know, uh, if you're a servant for corrupt masters, you, you, you're not always fighting the good fight. You're, you're sometimes you're being misused and exploited for uh, things that are other than honorable or other than honest uh, or humanitarian. So it's a, it's a touchy subject. Thanks. And Mike Lewis, you're one of the people who started out this conversation. Do you have any final thoughts on humanism and war? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> well, when I went into the military, you know, during the Vietnam era, I truly was naive and uh, had I just been more educated and up to speed on current events, I probably would not have chosen to go into the military. But, uh, you know, I assumed our leaders had best intentions and I was I thought I was being patriotic by trusting their judgment, and now I'm just far more skeptical. <clears throat> but still, even as a humanist, uh, the world is a dangerous place, and we even if one generation were to make it perfect and peaceful and peace-loving and stuff, someone was just born who's got different ideas, and as soon as they're able, they're going to rock the boat and stuff. So. <clears throat> I think that uh, to ensure freedom, or at least, you know, try to ensure freedom, a country is obliged to have a strong military. But I don't think we have to choose wars of, uh, you know, choice, not wars of necessity. And I think uh, World War II is probably our last war of necessity. So even though I came back from Vietnam in one piece, uh, I would be okay if no one ever said thank you for your service because I just can't have much pride of ownership of that. But it does do a lot of good. The military is one of the largest employers of last resort, and it turns a lot of people, you know, kids uh, who need to mature and uh have some responsibility and stuff. So I think the military serves to uh, help our young generation, some in need of a practical hands-on learning experience and it provides that. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, the military is a mixed blessing and it's our leaders you know, who are responsible for what we do. And I guess that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Jason, I will give the last thought to you as we wrap up our meeting. Oh, yeah, I appreciate it, everyone. Um, and yeah, if you if you've got some excitement about reaching out to the recruit depot, it's going to be a long haul. You know, it's an every week thing and, and there's going to be a lot of pushback on the way. But that having been said, it would be super beneficial. You know, you can really touch a lot of people. And um, I think it'd be a really great uh, opportunity here. But thank you again, Jason, and, and the whole community here for having a community, for having me on, for having this discussion. And uh, thanks to Keith, too, for, you know, poking the buttons a little bit, right? I hope he gets gets an opportunity to think that through, um, you know, and to talk about it a little bit more, even though today wasn't the day for it. Um, but thank you again, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and thanks for thanks for having Memorial Day today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Jason, for your hard work.